Hi, I'm Venus O'Hara and welcome to another video. Yesterday someone asked me if I could make a video about my life-changing books and here it is. Well, if you can see, this is part of my book collection, but I absolutely love reading and it's something I didn't do for many years because I was primarily a writer. I didn't want to be influenced by other people's writing styles. I just thought it was wouldn't be a good thing for me. I wanted to really concentrate on my own expression. But then the pandemic happened and with lockdown, I actually became a real bookworm. And I read 30 books last year in 2020. So I just went, uh, and it was incredible because um, I was just thinking, wow, if one book can really be life-changing, imagine how many more can be. And since then I've joined two book clubs here in Barcelona and I'm always getting new ideas or new suggestions for um, on my reading list. And it's just fascinating. I can't devour enough knowledge. It's absolutely fascinating. And I no longer believe that um, reading is a bad, has a negative effect on my own writing. I think the ab absolute opposite actually, actually can help me. And uh, yeah, so I'm a reader and there's no TV in my house. Anyway, I was looking about looking through my books and even though many of them are really amazing and I'll probably reread a lot of them, I've chosen the most life-changing ones for me. And they're very different, three very different books. And I'm gonna present them to you in the order or the, the order that I read them in. So the first one is Venus in Furs, Leopold. Von Sacker Massac. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but yeah, amazing. This book is amazing. I absolutely loved it. I was, um, my first boyfriend gave it to me when I was 18 or something. And at the time I was kind of like a clumsy, shy virgin. <laughs> well, I wasn't when he gave it to me, but you know, he was my first um, lover, etc. And he'd been with other people. So I always felt kind of, um, how would I say, um, I had a bit of an inferiority complex. So I didn't feel sexually confident at all not at all anyway when he gave this to me i was just read it and i was just like oh my god i want to be this venus and it's a story about this widow widow uh, who is called wanda von donaju or something and um he, she meets severin and he becomes her slave and there's no really sex in it but it's highly sensual there's some whipping in it, but it's really about the psychological relationship that impressed me, the sensuality. And I, I was always attracted to men who had an eye for small details, not the kind of guys who just focus on tits and ass, but the ones who kind of acknowledge and recognize and observe very kind of subtle details. That's something that's always really turned me on. So uh, this type of book is really about that. And then the word masoch, masochism, actually comes from this book and um, I'm not really into pain at all, physical pain, but the kind of psychological games that can evolve through BDSM scenarios are, are kind of really exciting to me. I think it's all about the brain and yeah, because I, I do think the brain is one of the, probably the biggest sexual organ and it's just um, so sensual and arousing without having any sex scenes in it. Because when I'm reading erotica, when the sex scenes start, I just find them really boring, especially if it's just focusing on logistics. He's touched me here, touched me there. I'm more interested in what's going on inside the person's head and what they're feeling. I'm really more into that. And this book was just wow. But um, what really, really impressed me about it is the description of Wanda when he first meets her. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I think it's from page 19. Oh yeah, here it is. I even remembered it's on page 19. So, she is there, Venus, but without furs. No, this time it is merely the widow, and yet Venus. Oh, what a woman! As she stands there in her light white morning gown, looking at me, her slight figure seems full of poetry and grace. She is neither large nor small. Her head is alluring, piquant, in the sense of the period of the French Marquise, rather than formerly beautiful. What enchantment and softness, what roguish charm play about her none too small mouth. Her skin is so infinitely delicate that the blue veins show through everywhere, even though the muslin covering her arms and even through the muslin covering her arms and bosom. How abundant her red hair it is red, not blonde or golden yellow. How diabolically and yet 
Tenderly it plays around her neck. Now her eyes meet mine like green lightning. They are green, these eyes of hers, whose power is so undescribable, green, but as are precious stones or deep, unfathomable, fathomable mountain lakes. She observes my confusion, which has even made me discourteous, for I have remained seated and still have my cap on my head. Doom. I love it. And I just love that description. It's just very, um, yeah, amazing. Amazing. So yeah, I, I did um, identify with that because uh, when I was a teenager, I, I was bullied at school for my white skin and the, the blue veins showing through and things like that. And this was kind of like, and I also studied history of art. So I was always very impressed by the Venus of the um, Renaissance. This is like another another dimension to my v Venusian fascination, because obviously the uh, the Venus that I saw in, in history of art of the Renaissance period were kind of very passive and um, yeah, sensual and passive, but this this woman has like got balls, and that was something that I really admired her, and I wanted to be like that, because I was a very clumsy virgin, not very sophisticated, and, and, so, and so my first boyfriend kind of like handed me this book and I was reading my own fantasy and, and it was his fantasy too so I just thought oh my god yes so this book amazing absolutely amazing and if you're if you're into kind of like psychological um how would I say seduction and this is definitely definitely a high recommendation I much um, I love it much more than the kind of Marquis de Sade or the um um, Fifty Shades, oh my god, this is like something much better. I, I do like the idea of the woman being dominant, even though it was really at the request of the slave, so it's not real, real domination, because I was into real femdom when you're actually genuinely in charge of things, not just because someone is telling you what to do, this is my fantasy, blah, 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 and you're kind of going along with it. So for me, it was just like, oh my god, so hot. But also recently, I came across another book, which is... Um, from because actually this is actually based on a true story, the Venus and Furs, and I found this book Wanda the Sacre Massacre, and this is the true story from the female perspective, Confession de ma vie. It, it, it was in French, and I found it at a very good price on Amazon. I haven't read it yet, but I'm very very intrigued, and um, I want to kind of like read something in French for for a change because I haven't read French for a long time, even though I do speak French. So that's going to be a future book for moi, pour moi. Mm. Okay, so next book. The next one. So that was, I read that when I was about 18, so a long time ago. Uh, and then the next one I read was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I've made millions of videos on here mentioning this book because it really is amazing. And this book completely transformed my perspective and understanding of sexuality. As you know, I've been a sexpert since 2009 and I've been really mainly focused on um, female pleasure and um, overcoming the taboo of sexuality in general and uh, yes yeah, so mainly about pleasure and get it trying to have your first orgasm and enjoy your body and all of those things but when I, when I read this book it, which was about success and and wealth and yeah mainly about success I came across a chapter called The Mystery of Sex Transmutation. I was completely baffled as to why there was a chapter about sexuality in a book about success. And it completely transformed my perspective on sexuality. I realized it wasn't just about physical pleasure, emotional pleasure or intimacy. It was actually a powerful tool. And it made me think or understand why sex is taboo because it's powerful, not because it's bad or sinful. And so, Sexual Transmutation, I've got this part of the book marked here. This is by Napoleon Hill, by the way. It was written in 1937, and it's the biggest selling, best selling um, success book of all time. So, Sex Energy it says, Sex energy is the creative energy of all genii. There has never been and never will be a great leader, builder, or artist lacking in this driving force of sex. The mere possession of this energy is not sufficient to produce a genius. The energy must be transmuted from desire for physical contact into some other form of desire and action before it will lift one to the status of a genius. Yes, I love it. So this really, really blew my mind because I just do believe that sexuality is its not something you choose. I think it's some, it's a kind of it's an energy that just consumes your body and your mind and your emotions sometimes as well. And I just, I think it's a real powerful force. And this is the force that 
has led me down this path to to share my message about sexuality. I did, I did not choose this. I think it chose me. And ever since I discovered this thing called sex transmutation, I have been using my sexual energy and channeling it towards my goals in life. And it's been pretty good because obviously whatever book you read in life, it's always good to read things and learn, but you have to apply these lessons to your life. Otherwise there's no point. You might just know a few things, but genuinely applying things that resonate with you to your life can be life changing. Yeah. And um, if you look this up in Amazon, you'll see there are millions of reviews that also recommend it. And also he talks about um, how to have a very clear idea about what you, what you want to achieve in life. And some other exercise in the book, he talks about making a statement about what you want, when you want it by and what you'll do in exchange for that. And then reading it every morning and every night and, and then even carrying it around with you. So I did that a couple of years ago. I had this piece of paper that I carried around with me and I was... I was reciting it in the morning and in the night. It's kind of like a consensual brainwashing, as I like to say, when I'm talking about meditation or affirmations or anything that has repetition in it. So, muy bien. Okay, the next book, oh my God, this is quite hardcore. Living an Orgasmic Life, Heal Yourself and Awaken Your Pleasure by Janet Paylett. This book really uh, was quite unsettling for me and with the title like this, Living an Orgasmic Life, I was very attracted to it, obviously, because I have my own The Orgasmic Lifestyle Project. So with a similar name, it just definitely grabbed my attention. And it has great reviews as well. And it looks like a kind of light, entertaining read, but it was, it is nothing further from the truth. It was very kind of quite hardcore for me. And as it says here, heal yourself and awaken your pleasure. So the first part of the book is really about healing yourself and getting over traumas. Oh, I've just opened the book now. It's like working with sexual trauma. And I really wasn't expecting to read something like this. And it made me kind of have to, it made me face my own demons, which was highly unsettling. And and also um, another thing that very inspired me about this book is um, the, the author's story. She didn't have them so, oops. She didn't have her own sexual awakening until she was about 50 or 51, which is so inspiring when you think about it, because she starts one of the chapters saying, imagine if your best sex, is, you still haven't lived yet. And I was thinking, oh my God, I hope so. Imagine that would be, I would have some pretty good times, but if there's better in the future, which I hope so, then I can't wait to live it. But, um, <clears throat> so that her story is very inspiring. Um, and she had a sexless marriage for, for maybe lots, many 20 years or something before this happened. So. There is hope. There's, you can never lose hope. And anyway, back to trauma. Yes, yeah, so this was really, oh my God. And there are some exercises in the book as well. And it really helps you. Or if you if you want to, you can kind of like really face some of your traumas and try and address them and get over them. And I think um, many people do have um, kind of me too stories and stories of sexual trauma. It's so common. And for me, um, before the me too thing happened, it was something I kind of repressed. I have a lot of Me Too stories, unfortunately, um, like many people do. And for me, it was something I didn't want to kind of go into. And if any kind of headline came up in, in news about someone sharing a, a kind of abuse story or something like that, I just wouldn't like to kind of, kind of, kind of repressed it and trying to imagine that I hadn't seen it kind of thing. But then when the Me Too thing happened, it was everywhere in your face. And these stories just came up all over the place. and became very common and that for me um, has really helped in my own processing of these of these emotions. I have had therapy as well in the past about this and uh, I just now that I realize how common it is it, it just feels easier to deal with not that that's a good thing it should not be a good thing at all but um, but this really uh, this was kind of like facing my demons as I said. And another thing that really kind of like was a bit traumatic for me was the attachment theory, attachment styles. And that's something I hadn't really come across before. Maybe I did when I was studying psychology many years ago. I didn't really um, pay any attention to it. And it talks about attachment styles such as secure attachment, avoidant attachment, ambivalent attachment, and anxious avoidant attachment. And it talks about your the child's general state of being and then how you become an adult through it or what you believe. And I just realized that my my commitment phobia stems from my childhood. I was like, oh, 
I just made me think, I didn't choose my life. It was all set in stone from my childhood, my kind of commitment phobia and, and fear of intimacy. And I mean, I've, I've never had, I mean, I've had many relationships and lots of intimacy in my life, but I've never, ever, ever been with someone who I thought was my future. I've always kept that distance, maybe through fear or whatever it is, but I just found it, oh my God, kind of eye-opening to think that that my life wasn't, I didn't really choose it, it just kind of was inevitable <laughs> kind of thing. It made me question a lot of things, yeah. So that was, uh... and then after the healing part, I just get kind of more orgasmic. And there are some exercises about intuition and peak sexual experiences. So it's not all uh, doom and gloom, that sounds like bad, but it's, if you want to kind of uh, get over some sexual, sexual obstacles in your life and become orgasmic, then I definitely recommend it. And it does talk about sacred sexuality as well, tantra, pleasure potential, slow sex. So there's a lot in this book, even though it doesn't look like a big book, but it's full of great stuff. Yeah, so oh, that was quite deep. Well, it was for me anyway. <laughs> anyway, there are my three life-changing books and I'm still reading loads of books and I have many more great books to share with you. I'm reading a great book at the moment called Modern Sex Magic, which is just, oh my God, amazing. Um, but yeah, so they, they are my three books. And if you have any life-changing books to share, please share in the comments below because I'm always looking for things to add to my reading list and also to help to enhance my life. And if you have any questions or um, suggestions for new videos, don't hesitate to contact me at venus at venusohara.org and I will see you very soon.